This is Rick Levine with your July 2024 mid-month update that is normally only distributed to my $3 a month Patreon subscribers. Now, for those of you who are already Patreon subscribers, thank you very much for supporting this work. I appreciate it. I appreciate you greatly. And for those of you who don't, you certainly uh, are invited to uh, join us at patreon.com slash Rick Levine. However, this month, the mid-month update will be distributed widely, publicly to everyone. I do this a couple times a year when either there are extraordinary events unfolding um, or just simply when there's some, some reason to. And, and this month, it seems to be extraordinary event, events that certainly are unfolding. Now, for those of you who watch my uh, monthly event and or my Soul Food uh, Astrology Night event at the beginning of the month, you know that I talked about the period of time from July 13th 15th through 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, which is where we are now. We're going to come back to that in just a moment, and we're going to focus on the middle part of July all the way through the end. But before I get into that, I just want to do a very quick reminder that I will be doing a uh, retreat for the third time at the same place in the south end of Goa, India, um, at Palalam Beach, a beautiful beach. It's at an Ayurvedic healing spa, and uh, enrollment will be limited, and there still is room. So I'm just wanting everyone to know that since this is in India, and for many people that means a major trip, um, it's uh, November 23rd through December 4th, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing this as an initiation into astrology, and it does everything. We do everything from uh, from uh, lecture to uh, experiential work to astro drama to planet movements, planetary movements, planet walk, so on. Uh, and uh, complete day by day information is available. It's a 12 day. Uh, a fully immersive retreat and day-by-day -day, uh, activities and curriculum is available along with all the information at Heaven and Earth Workshops. That's all one word, heavenandearthworkshops.com. And I look forward to seeing some of you there. So with no further ado, let's jump into the middle part of July, which is already unfolding in ways that uh, are not surprising and yet are totally shocking all at the same time. Uh, we've uh, certainly had a high level of focus and will continue to on the political scene here in the United States, certainly the political scene uh, around the world because there have been very important elections in, uh, in the UK and in France um, there are things happening, uh, you know, in, in all, through in the Congo and Somalia. Um, obviously, in uh, the Middle East, in uh, um, in Gaza and in Israel, uh, it's just been in Tunisia. I mean, the world right now is in a bit of a. It feels like a bit of a free fall meltdown, and this is really why I wanted to make this video available for everyone because I can tell not only just by watching the news, but I can tell by the amount of emails that I'm getting uh, from, uh, from people, from regular clients and students, but from other people, um, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of nervousness or about what, what's going on and, and where all this is, is going. And um, 
earlier today. By the way, I am recording this on the uh, late afternoon of Wednesday, July 17th with the moon in Sagittarius. And I hope to have this posted by sometime early tomorrow. That would be Thursday, July 18th. And we will take a look at from now through the rest of the month with some larger overview stuff, just because a lot of the things that are going on now are tied to, obviously tied to bigger events. And also we'll take a look back um, a couple of days ago um, at the what was going on during or around the time of the attempted assassination that unfolded um, uh, just this week with um, with President Trump uh, being uh, wounded and uh, at, at an outdoor rally. And so we'll look at that a, a little bit. And we'll look at that in light of a larger stream of, of, of events that are obviously still unfolding. So I did a um, Instagram live this afternoon on Astrology Hub, and in it, I someone asked the question. So, um, you know, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety and uncertainty, and uh, and 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 I'm worried. Um, you know, can you say something about that? And what I said was that based upon what's going on, that if you're not feeling a bit anxious or a bit worried or concerned or have a sense of uncertainty, then you're not paying attention to what's going on because um, because there is we are at a time of great transition. And although it feels like there's a lot going on right now, from an astrological point of view, what's going on right now is really a large determinant or a piece of a se- sequence of events that will lead all the way up through the beginning of next year and then on through 25, 2025, 2026, um, and everything will be different. It's, it's definitely, we are at a, an apex of sorts um, of a whole lot of change. So having said that, um, let's start off and talk a little bit about the past few days because um, this certainly was a uh, shocking event. And unfortunately, in today's political climate, it was more shocking than surprising because the tenor of polarity, which is something that we've been talking about here, I've been talking about here um, for months, even for years now, um, this has been greater and greater and greater. And, and although I think there's always been a sense of, of polarity uh, here in the United States and even around the world, the, one of the differences is right now the instantaneity of the feedback from social media, which then heightens the energy. It rewards the immediate response rather than the considered response. And because of the algorithms of social media, it rewards the stuff that is angry and hateful and and doesn't fit in easily. Um, it's the the outside stuff that causes shock and so on that that basically is monetarily even rewarded on social media. So we live in complicated times, and and that is certainly an important starting point. However, or in addition, we just recently had an event. That that occurs every other year, or a little bit, little bit, a uh, little bit more often than that. Um, and I'm speaking of the Mars Uranus conjunction. Mars takes a little bit less than two years to go through the zodiac once, and and then it catches up to each planet in those planets' normal movements. And so, Mars. On July 15th, on Monday, July 15th, Mars actually aligned with Uranus, as it does almost every other year, and it often is correspondent to events that unfold within a few days, usually, from my tracking, a few days prior to the actual perfection of the conjunction, and I'll say more about that in a moment as to why, Um, but 
but although there are times when not a lot happens, there are other times when things do happen, and there certainly is a um, consistency to the energy that is expressed. And in order to look at the energy or to understand the energy that's expressed, very simply, we need to look at the two planets involved. You know, Mars is the planet of conflict. It's the god of war. Mars is about creating and maintaining boundaries, whether they're defensive boundaries that I'm maintaining so that my space is not encroached by you or others, or whether it's boundaries that I make by forcing my energy into your space and aggressing or asserting it's the difference between offensive and defensive boundaries. Um, But in both cases, Mars is the planet that actually does the conflict, does the fighting at the edge of creating or maintaining these boundaries. Uranus, on the other hand, is uh, the planet that was the first planet that was discovered out past the um, orbit of Saturn. And we moderners sometimes just can't quite understand what it must have been like to live when Uranus was discovered in the late 1700s. Incidentally, around the same period of time that Pluto moved into Aquarius, the um, the time previous to what it's doing now, and around the time of Um, the American Revolution and the American Constitution and setting up the American judicial system and the Declaration of Independence and also even the the French Revolution. Um, It was a pretty amazing time here on planet Earth, um, at least from our perspective here in the Western world. Now, Mars lines up with Uranus every other year. And as it does, Mars brings the energy of physicality, of direction, of energy to Uranus. Uranus, which is the planet of shock, awakening, surprise. Again, if you were living in the late 1700s when Uranus was discovered, overnight, you're, it's like something happened and and the local world, the universe around us, the solar system, tripled in size. It was like for thousands of years, Saturn was the observed limit, and then all of a sudden, crash, new, new world, new awakening, and, uh, and things were different than they were. Uranus is the planet of shock, awe, surprise, unexpected. Um, it's the planet of revolution. It's the planet of sudden change. Um, and I said earlier that often Uranian transits happen just before the perfection or the exact, unlike Saturn transits, which Saturn transits, which sometimes happen, you know, around the time of its perfection or even a day or two or weeks later, because Saturn is constrictive and restraining, and Uranus is like a hair trigger. Oh, I don't even want to use that terminology. Uranus is, um, is, it's like an electrical spark or like lightning that it just takes the right amount of energy and wham, something happens. Something is released and it's often impulsive. It's often spontaneous. Um, it's often unexpected. Um, and it's often very difficult to wrap our heads around it when it happens. Uh, because I am an astrologer and I have a computer, um, I ran a list of all the times that Mars and Uranus lined up exactly from 1900 all the way up to July 15th, 2024. And the first date on my list was November 3rd, 1901. Um, when Mars and Uranus um, aligned um, actually at 15 degrees of Sagittarius. Uh, And so I went to my computer and I said, what happened on November 3rd, 1901? Uh, And I was quickly informed that one day prior, again the day before, on November 2nd, 1901, one day prior to the exact perfected Mars-Uranus conjunction, the, um, uh, there was an assassination of President William McKinley that occurred in Buffalo, and, um, and it was 
on that day or it was 20 you know like i said it was 24 hours uh, before and then i started cycling through it in 1905 there was another conjunction and um and it was within an, in october um and it was within a few days of the uh, russian revolution of 1905 the uprising that was instrumental in getting tsar nicholas to acquiesce and uh, and begin the transformation of the russian um, autocracy into a constitutional um, uh, a government and then the next one was in 1907 in may and in may of 1907 was the first like real global uh, financial crisis meltdown that um, was called the uh, panic of 1907 and um and I just began to see this pattern of things happening very close to that 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 event, um, and, and and then I took a jump a little bit closer to to now, and um, and I looked at the conjunction in on March twenty second of twenty thirteen, and in the three days leading up to that exact conjunction, there were the following news items. And I have to say that I looked at many other dates and I never saw another date that even came close to this one, two, three, four, five, six, six totally different events. I'm not going to read them all, but um, three days before the exact perfection, um, 98 people were killed and 248 in injured um, across Iraq that were from a series of bombings and shootings. On the same day, a car bombing killed 10 people and injured 20 people in Mogadishu, Somalia. On the same day, there was explosions that killed 25 people at a bus park um, in Kano, Nairobi. Uh, I'm sorry, that was Kano, Nigeria, excuse me. Um, the following day, 16 people were killed by mudslides in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the same day, um, there were 30 people, 27 people um, killed and 14 injured in a bush crash, crash in India. And it goes on and on and, and on. And again, I, I, I've never seen another day where I've looked at one day and just seen so many unrelated but interrelated by time um, events. And th then, of course, I, my mind jumped um, to more recent, um, just back a couple of years ago, well, actually now um, uh, three years ago, when um, Mars moved into Taurus. Now, Uranus right now is in Taurus. So Uranus moves pretty slowly. It takes 84 years for Uranus to go around the zodiac around the sun once, and it spends about seven years in each sign. Uranus first tipped into Taurus, where it is now, uh, in 2018, and in March of 2019, Uranus entered Taurus, where it's been ever since. Prior to that, it backed into Aries for a bit. And so, um, and Uranus will remain in Taurus until next um, uh, until 2025 next spring next uh, next year when Uranus moves into Gemini and uh, kind of dances right on the edge there for a little bit but when Mars entered Taurus on the uh, midday of January 6th 2021 Although Mars wasn't conjoined with Uranus, it was the first time that Mars tipped into Taurus while Uranus was in Taurus lining up close enough that that event was, in effect, energetically tied to the Mars um, conjunction uh, to Uranus. And that exact uh, co conjunction occurred just a couple of weeks later when Mars finally caught up to Uranus at about six, six degrees, I think it was, six, seven degrees of um, Taurus. Uh, um, and the exact conjunction was on January 20th on the day that Joe Biden was inaugurated as president of the United States. So we astrologers look at, at astrological events and we try to create patterns based upon what happened at previous times. And so we astrologers all knew, I talked about this well in advance, not that anything not that there was anything special about that most competent astrologers had their eye on this 
Mars Uranus conjunction that was exact on um, Monday, the opening day of the Republican National Convention on Monday, July 15th. Now, the thing that makes this different than so many of the other conjunctions, aside from the fact that Jupiter had just aligned with Uranus back at the end of April, stirring up a whole lot of uh, um, street rebellion uh, around the planet, certainly at the American universities, but in all over the world um, in reference to the um, uh, Gaza uh, and uh, the Palestinian um, genocide and what's going on um, in, in the Middle East there. And that was very tightly associated with Jupiter's alignment with Uranus back on April 20th of of this year. And so now as Mars sweeps by um, Uranus, or as it did on Monday, there's even a third thing that becomes important in all of this, and that is that that conjunction was at um, about 26 and a half degrees of Taurus. And at 26 and a half degrees of Taurus, there is a fixed star, a star in the sky called Algol. And I know that many of you watching know all about or know a lot about um, fixed stars because when there are planetary uh, alignments that involve a particular fixed star, the fixed stars have mythologies and characteristics and, and archetypes similar to what the planetary or the zodiac archetypes are. And Algol has a relatively, no, Algol has a very nasty reputation. Ptolemy, over two millennia ago, wrote, Algol is the most treacherous star in the sky. Algol is actually in the constellation of Perseus. Perseus was a hero warrior, and he's known for slaying Medusa, the Gorgon, Dusa who had snakes for hair, and anyone who approached her who looked at her was immediately so horrified that they were turned to stone, and yet Perseus was able to um, behead her with a special sword and a mirror that he could approach her backwards so he wasn't looking directly at her. Um, And Algol which is a very weird star. It's a binary star that pulses very fast, and it's just always been considered to be a bit evil. Well, Algol is considered to be the beheaded Medusa in the constellation of Perseus. And and although we think of Medusa um, as the angry she-goat hissing and out of control and treacherous and and it's definitely you know a feminine energy that is treacherous it's been understood in more modern times the full story of medusa who actually was a priestess in um in in the church of aphrodite and um and medusa was um, uh, beautiful and had beautiful hair and was a virgin priestess and was pursued by Neptune. And one day Neptune's coming on to uh, Medusa quite intensely and Medusa runs into the temple looking for um, assistance from uh, Aphrodite or uh, for the Greek that's Minerva and, um, and, and she's not there and Neptune rapes her. And Aphrodite comes back uh, and uh, sees what's happened and immediately is outraged at her temple being desecrated and punishes um, uh, Medusa uh, and uh, actually turned her hair, her beautiful hair, into snakes. By the way, the, the uh, progeny from that rape was Pegasus, the flying horse. But... Medusa actually, aside from being this horrific Gorgon, was actually the first documented Me Too victim. Uh, Medusa was raped by Neptune, but but Neptune was a god, and so 
uh, when Aphrodite Minerva came back into the temple, she blamed the victim. Now, what does all this have to do with uh, this recent conjunction of Mars and, and Uranus? Well, it was lined up with this star, Algol, which is a difficult and complicated star because on one hand it is the star of decapitation. Um, it's the star of, um, of losing one's head. It's the star of, um, uh, of uh, treachery, of evil. And it turns out that this um, star actually is at the same place where Nancy Pelosi's Mars is in her birth chart. And it's also at the same place it falls directly on um, Donald Trump's midheaven, that's the point at which we stand up in the outer world, our career. And that same point is also exactly opposed, opposite Donald Trump's Scorpio. I'm sorry, it's also opposed Joe Biden's Scorpio son. So Joe Biden's Scorpio son is opposed by Al Gaul at 26 and a half degrees of, um, um, of Taurus. So... It's very um, intriguing that this uh, shot, this assassination attempt, and I know there's a lot of stories that are going around about a lot of potential possibilities of was it this, was it this. There's so many questions of why was this person doing it? Had they? Uh, I'm not delving into any of those. Feel free to do that on your own. Um, in fact, I think we should all be digging into everything these days. But it was a release of pent-up tension, Mars, an act of violence, Uranus, something sudden, conjunct Algol, it was impacted Donald Trump's head. And had it been um, a little bit of a different scenario, um, it would have basically been like a decapitation. Um, and I just want to say here that um, I don't care uh, well, I do care, <laughs> but regardless of whether you are uh, um, uh, a never-Trumper, Trumper, a thiser or thatter or whatever you are, the fact of the matter is that there is no place in American culture for, um, for this type of behavior. And I would say the same regardless of anyone who was put in harm's way or who was um, assassinated or attempted uh, uh, an attempted assassination target, you know, whether, um, whether it was uh, William McKinley back at the Mars-Uranus conjunction in November of 1901, whether it was Abraham Lincoln, whether it was Martin Luther King, whether it was Robert Kennedy Jr., doesn't matter who it is, um, whether you're a forum or a ginnum, um, there's no place for that. And it is um, and, and it is, I think, a complicating um, statement of the times in which we live. So I wanted to begin by just talking about that a little bit because that event is actually tied to future events. And this is why we do astrology, is we do it to look at patterns so that we can understand or have a better sense of what may be going on and going on in, in the future. Um, the... Uh, the, one of the things to kind of keep in mind um, is that as planets move around, they will continue to make aspects um, to Uranus, and the more complicating or difficult aspects that will be made to Uranus um, begin over the summer and still unfold, you know, over the year ahead, even until next year when Uranus leaves Taurus and moves into Gemini. But this is the one that will be the closest to, uh, to Algol, that the Mars-Uranus conjunction occurring on this fixed star Algol, I think, is a um, key piece here, and we will see how it plays out. I do want to mention that, um, that on, um, on, on July 21st, um, Uranus will actually perfect, because Uranus moves slowly, and right now, today, um, uh, today July 17th, um, Uranus is at 
26 degrees and 25 minutes of Taurus. That means it's just not quite barely 26 and a half degrees. Well, Algol right now is at about uh, 26 degrees and 34 minutes because although the fixed stars don't move, they change in the zodiac because of the wobble of the Earth very, very slowly at the rate of about one whole degree every 72 years. This is the precession of the equinox that we're not going down that rabbit hole further today, but that's what creates the changing of the ages, the changing of the age from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. However, on July 21st, Uranus will reach 26 degrees of Taurus and 34 minutes, and that will be the precise exact alignment of Uranus and Algol, even though the Mars-Uranus conjunction occurred within about a sixth of a degree away from it being exact, which in astrology is plenty close enough, but I'm just making a point here that by um, by the end of next week, by July 21st, we may have another round of something on this that may have something to do with the investigation, something, um, something to do with something in the presidency, um, but um, we will look at that uh, July 21st date a little bit more because it is, it is an important one. Also, as we move on, um, later this year, and I'm just going to throw out a couple of these dates. We will come back to them over the weeks and months ahead. But on October 13th, Venus opposes Uranus. And that's a pretty tricky day because there's a lot of other stuff going on, um, including a sun square Mars. Um, I, I don't want to drill down on that any more than just mentioning October 13th. And again, when I mention a date like this, it's always plus or minus a day or two. It's just, you know, it's not exact. These the, the conjunctions or the aspects are exact, but the energy gets close enough, and if something's ripe, pop, it happens. Uh, like this particular assassination attempt that occurred two days prior to the exact um, uh, the exact conjunction. On October 30th, Mercury moves in opposite Uranus. And then on November 15th, there's a full moon opposite Uranus, um, which means uh, that um, and actually the full moon is, is conjuncting Uranus and the sun is opposite Uranus. In other words, the Uranus at that time will be at about 27 or 28 degrees of Taurus. And as the sun moves through 28, 20, 28 degrees um, of um, Scorpio in the um, middle of November, <coughs> the full moon will be actually exactly aligned with Uranus, and that full moon, um, uh, um, the full moon, the full moon conjunct Uranus will be within one sixth of a degree orb, about 11 minutes of orb, so it'll be very, very tight. Um, and then there are things that go on into the future that also have to do with, I think, more unfoldings um, next year. Uh, and, uh, and and I don't want to drill down too far on them right now. I'm only mentioning that, that there has been a tremendous release of tension, and how we use it is really important and unfortunately we don't have a particular um, we don't have a particularly good history of how we um, how we react to, to sudden events like that we often react with the same sense of of impulsiveness as the act actually um, occurred under which sometimes takes us into places where uh, we don't need to be all right so now let's look at the chart for July 17th and um, we are today, uh, July 17th with the moon in Sagittarius and um, I'm just going to take us through the rest of the month uh, day by day and we will kind of see where we go with all of this. Um, what's it, wh One of the interesting things to me is that July 15th astrologically was such a big day with the Mars conjuncting Uranus. Um, let me just put that chart up here so we can start with that. So let's look at the chart for uh, July 15th, and we can see that the moon is moving through Scorpio, actually uh, moving toward its opposition with Uranus and Mars midday. And 
we can see that the exact Mars Uranus conjunction here is at in the 26 26 degrees of of Taurus. Um, but what I want to point out here also is that on the same day, on the 15th, we also have the Sun making a square with Chiron. And that Sun square with Chiron is an interesting square because in some ways, um, in some ways, the Sun in Cancer, the caring, the nurturing, um, is wanting to wanting to fix, wanting to heal um, it, because it's squaring Chiron, because it's having memories or it's reminiscent um, of some old either emotional wound or even a physical wound. Wound. And yet it's almost like the square makes it that the more we try to fix it, the worse it gets. In other words, we it's like we can voice our forgiveness or our empathy. And yet when push comes to shove, we're just stimulating um, the energy even more. We're opening the wound wider rather than closing it. Um, and so, um, you know, we can look here during this period of time as people saying they're looking for unity, for example, but in fact may still be um, very uh, definitely uh, uh, talking about, you know, um, stirring up the pot or anger or, or, or hate. So just uh, that's, that was on the 15th. It was a, a very big day. Uh, and, uh, and as we move forward um, from the 15th on to the 16th by the evening, that would, um, um, that would be uh, Tuesday evening on the 16th, the moon moves from Scorpio into Sagittarius. It did that at 6.24 p.m. And of course, all times that I give here are Pacific Daylight Time now. So you need to adjust to your time zone accordingly. But in the evening on the 16th, the moon moves into, um, uh, moved, because it's in the past, um, moved into Sagittarius, where it still is. But once it does that, it's a relatively quiet energy. I mean, the moon um, does oppose uh, um, uh, Jupiter, but by midday on the uh, 17th, that's today, the moon is just approaching that opposition to Jupiter. Things may seem a little better, or maybe we're breathing a little deeper. There's it, it, it's there's a lot of stuff going on, but there's a feeling of 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 over of uh, over of 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 overstatement of of people saying too much. There's just too much going on too quickly. I think. And then um, on the 18th is really when the energy picks up. On the 18th, we have a couple of very important things. First of all, the moon moving through Sagittarius makes a temporary grand fire trine, trining Chiron in Aries and trining Mercury in Leo. And this basically it, it sets up a, a, a scenario where we can actually speak speak because it's Mercury. We're talking about communication because Mercury is part of this grand trine. Now, um, today on July 18th, and whenever I say today, I'm referring to the chart that we're looking at in front of us, Mercury is making an exact trine to Chiron. It's perfecting that trine to Chiron, meaning that our words actually can be soothing. Our ca they can be healing. They, the, the words actually can um, contain a real element of forgiveness, but it's Mercury and Leo, so it may be a little bit performance or a little bit showy. And on top of that, the moon moving through Sagittarius midday on Thursday makes a grand fire trine with Mercury and Chiron. And so we might be a little cavalier. We might be a little bit too quick and too easy, um, you know, to uh, do our uh, forgiving or to, um, or to interact with others in a way that kind of is more empathetic rather than, um, than um, judgmental. But it's important to know that when Mercury turns retrograde on uh, August 4th at 4 degrees of Virgo, it will then back all the way up um, by August 28th, it'll back all the way up to 21 degrees of Leo. So that means that right now, Mercury is moving through an area that it will move through forward and then move through retrograde 
and then it'll move through forward or direct a third and final time um, on through the end of August and on through September. And so we're in this little kind of tidal swirl of communication here. Even though things are going forward, Mercury is moving direct. They're not moving direct very quickly anymore. And there are things that are happening now that even though they feel like they're final, they may actually be part of a longer course of events that takes time to unfold even through um, August and on into September. So that's the first thing about the 18th. The next thing about the 18th that is significant is that the sun at 26 degrees of Cancer is making a sextile with Uranus at 26 degrees of Taurus. And the sun moves about a degree a day, so we might be feeling this on the 17th, 18th, and even into the 19th. But this is different than the Mars conjoining um, Uranus, because that was a sudden release of fire energy, of, of the Mars, of the assertion and the direction. Now, Mars is still close to Uranus. It's only a couple of degrees away. And what that means is that this, that is that, um, is that, uh, the sun makes a sextile today um, with Uranus, but the sun will also make a sextile with Mars. But because the sun and Mars are moving at such a similar um, rate now, right now, they're going to stay within kind of close, you know, close orb um, for a couple of weeks. And in fact, the sun doesn't reach the exact sextile to Mars until July 25th. And so we have this whole period of time where there's still going to be this energy that's being expressed. We're living in a heightened state of, of, of boundaries being defined. And yet with sextiles, there may be more opportunity um, for, for working with the energy than just simply saying things and having things be disruptive. Um, I like this sun that is sextiling Uranus and Mars, because theoretically it can help move some of that energy. Um, and it can help move some of that energy along. Now, the 18th is a powerhouse because also on the 18th, we have the Sun also not just making that sextile with Uranus, but it's also making a half square with Jupiter. And for those of you who know my work, you know that I believe that from observation um, that half squares are very, very much as potent as squares. Um, they're more narrow in their operation. They're more precise sometimes, but they are motivating. And motivation is actually a good thing if you're doing something good. <laughs> but you can be motivated to do something that's not healthy or or not a good a good deed, and as the sun um, makes this semi square or half square with Uranus, that's exact later in the evening on today the eighteenth. Um, as it does that, we may feel overconfident in whatever our actions are. We may become so sure of ourselves that that combined with that grand fire trine, that we may take action that we maybe would be advised not to take. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just kind of crawl into our holes, our caves, put our head in the sand and do nothing. It just, this is a good day to count to 10 or 20 or 50 before you do anything, um, because it's easy to just be so flooded with with self certainty self yeah with um with with self reflected certainty that we take action when maybe it's not completely advised and that even is um exacerbated even more by the fact that mars at 28 and a half degrees of taurus is coming into making a sextile to um, to Neptune and a trine to Pluto. We'll see these unfold in a couple of days, but that Mars is already pulling the Uranus. Mars is be pulling on this trine to Pluto. It won't be exact until Mars leaves Taurus and enters Gemini, and that'll be on July 20th. 
But we're going to be feeling this energy of the stuff coming up from deeper places, stuff coming out from hidden realms, Pluto, the Mars trine Pluto. The, but the Mars sextile to Neptune, it's still hard to know what's going on. I feel like a broken record sometimes. There's been so much Neptunian um, activity that, that Neptune, in a way, it makes it difficult, if not impossible, um, to know what the truth is. Nevertheless, I think it's really important that we practice listening to our higher self, our higher voice, take the high road, aim for something higher, and in all of our actions, at least keep that in mind before we just respond from the gut. So that's the 18th. It's a big day. Um, and then as we move on, um, early in the morning on the 19th, the moon will move from Sagittarius into Capricorn. And here at noon on Friday the 19th, we can see that the moon um, is now in Capricorn. Um, and on the 19th, we also have um, an interesting thing with the nodal axis. Normally, I don't talk a whole lot about this, but I think it's important because it just deepens the meaning of what's going on. We have Venus at 9 degrees of Leo making a trine to the north node to one side of the nodal axis and a sextile to the other. I think this is a chance for our values to kind of resonate, to come out more. And, you know, the north node is kind of the theoretical direction in which the soul is is moving. And here it's moving towards self-expression and independence. And with Venus and Leo, there's a, a pride, a proudness of wanting to in some way express that. But I see this as a healthy um, energy, again, as long as we don't overdo it, because we're still coming off of that sun um, half square to Jupiter that was exact yesterday. The other thing that's occurring with the nodal axis is with Mercury. And with Mercury, it's a little bit harder to see because it's not a zodiacal aspect. It's not a regular traditional Ptolemaic aspect. But Mercury is a square and a half. That's 90 degrees as a square, 45 is half of that, 90 and 45 is 135 degrees. And Mercury is making a square and a half to the north node, which means it's making a half square to the south node. So as Venus is stirring up the sweet energy of 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 um, being proud and holding on to our values and knowing what we want and what we like and kind of working on that trajectory, the words aren't quite supporting it. The mental process, the mercurial energy at a half square to the south node and a square and a half to the north node is kind of being a bit disruptive. We may we may get messages today that we don't want to hear. We may say something that people misinterpret or maybe they interpret it correctly and they don't want to hear it. But either way, it does complicate the energy. As we move toward the weekend on Saturday, um, we have uh, the moon still moving through Capricorn. And on Saturday the 20th, something very important happens, but it doesn't happen until early afternoon. Actually, it happens at 1.43 p.m. Pacific time. And that is that if we look at the chart here, we can see that Mars is at 29 degrees um, of Leo and about 57 minutes. Um, it's just like three minutes of arc away from being at zero degrees of, um, of, of Gemini. And, um, and so we have Mars changing signs today. And as Mars changed signs, as I said the other day, it's going to begin picking up on that trine to Pluto at zero degrees of Aquarius. And so Mars, um, even at midday, at 29 degrees and 57 minutes, um, of Taurus, that Mars is already within one degree of making a trine um, to uh, Pluto, and it's already um, just past, um, having done it earlier this morning, um, making a sextile to, um, to Neptune that actually occurred at about 8.15 this morning. But we're getting this energy of Mars to Pluto and Neptune that's really powerful, and it's really wiring us into something deeper, but what's also happening is the energy's about to shift. 
This shifting energy we can feel when Mars moves into Gemini. The other planet that's in Gemini is Jupiter. Jupiter has been in Gemini just for a couple months. It moved into Gemini back in May. Um, and as Mars and Jupiter are in the same sign, Mars is moving faster than Jupiter, and it will catch up to Jupiter. And remember, Mars is about boundaries. Mars is about forcing ourselves into new territory or defending what we believe that we need to do to maintain our, um, to protect ourselves from being vulnerable. And Mars actually catches up to Jupiter, just like it caught up to Uranus, um, on, on the 15th of July, Mars will catch up to Jupiter on August 19th. And that's a chart we'll look at in depth on the August forecast, because August 19th is not only the opening of the Democratic National Convention, but it's also the full moon um, in Aquarius, and that full moon in Aquarius is exactly partile, that means same degree, square to Uranus. And again, we have this disruptive Uranus energy, and so we will hold that off. But again, I'm trying to put this into a larger flow so that we can see that the events that happen that feel like they're in isolation are actually part of a flow. So here, as we look at the 20th, we can see this Sometimes what's called what's sometimes called a minor grand trine, um, which is really a trine with a planet at the midpoint or the sextiling both sides. That would be Neptune, and what that energy does is it really creates a flow and deepens the power and the and and the uh, passion and this and the determination. Um, this is a high level of determination um, of that Mars in, at the very end of Taurus, but it's like it's it's a, called a critical degree or an anoretic degree. It's it, although it's at the last degree, it's like when it moves into Gemini, everything changes, and so we feel sometimes like we got to do something right now, or we won't get the chance to do it. On the twenty first. We can see here, actually, even on the 20th, we can see that the moon is at late degrees of, of um, Capricorn, and by midday on the 21st, the moon is at 4 degrees of Aquarius. What that means is at 3.17 a.m. on the morning, that's Pacific Daylight Time, on the morning of Sunday, July 21st, we have a full moon that's at 29 degrees and 9 minutes of Capricorn. That's just before the moon changes signs into, um, into Aquarius. The moon um, ch changes signs into Aquarius at 4.42 a.m., but it's full at 3.17 a.m. And this full moon is another important transition period because in some ways it almost represents the culmination of something. That something may be related to what we were doing two weeks ago um, back at the um, back at the new moon because that new moon in Cancer in some ways set the tone that was back on July 5th. And so we may look in our calendars and see what was going on then and how things may be coming to fruition. But this is a huge uh, full moon because this full moon is actually also conjunct uh, uh, Pluto because the moon, um, the moon is full at 29 and a half degrees, just about 20, 29 degrees and, and nine minutes, a little bit over 29 degrees of Capricorn. And, um, and just a, a degree or two later is Pluto. So like four hours or so after the new, after the full moon, the moon is actually lining up with Pluto. And before it does that, it's going to make a sextile with um, with Neptune, as it's at 29 degrees just after the full moon, 29 degrees of Pisces. And it's also going to make a trine with Uranus a few hours prior to the full moon. And then it's going to make a trine with Mars, um, you know, also just after the full moon. So this is an incredible powerhouse. And on top of that, at the same time as this full moon is unfolding, we also have Venus making a sextile with Jupiter. 
and that Venus sextile Jupiter can be rather sweet and I think it's an important thing to hold on to, but it also can sugarcoat something that isn't so sweet. So we need to pay attention to that. But Venus being the planet, you know, of pleasure, and this is the show. This is the, this is the what looks good. Venus and Leo. Um, it's the performance. Um, but it's sextile to Jupiter in Gemini says there's an opportunity here. So what are we going to perform? What are we going to make look good? And yet the same day on the 21st still, we have Mercury making a square with Uranus. Now I mentioned this earlier because we have Mercury making a square with Uranus on July 21st and then we had a whole sequence of, of, of other squares. What did I do with that piece of paper? There it is. We have uh, um, yeah, Mercury making the square um, on July 21st, while Uranus is exactly, exactly conjoined Algol. So Mercury will be square Algol. We can expect something here that I think reflects back to the assassination. Doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, it doesn't mean at all another assassination attempt. It means more likely some information that comes out in reference to it, or there's another whole scenario that's played out. But these are about words, these are about information, Mercury squaring Uranus while Mercury squares Algol. This, I think, is a really big day and a big full moon. Um, and of course, because, as I said earlier, the full moon is coming around and it is making a sextile to Neptune um, at just just prior to the um, um, actually just 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 right after the full moon. I mean, like minutes after the full moon. What that means is that the sun is also coming into a trine with Neptune and the sun's trine to uh, Neptune um, is exact later in the evening at 8.25 p.m. So July 21st, um, that even though it's a Sunday, this is a powerhouse of a day. Um, Mars making that exact trine to Pluto, um, the sun making an exact trine to Neptune. I think in some ways here, this day is a little bit of foreshadowing of what it is that's coming around the bend. And I don't know exactly what that means now, um, but there's this whole sequence of, of sextiles from the moon Pluto at late Capricorn and, and Aquarius um, to Neptune, uh, around to Uranus Mars, and back around to the sun. And in some ways, this same sequence of events is going to be with us on and off for the next couple of years as these slower moving planets, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus go in and out of those trines and sextiles. So this is a big day, big day, big important day. Uh, and, and, and we notice, remember, the moon was, was full at 29 degrees of Capricorn, which means the sun on the 21st is at 29 degrees of Cancer, which means that by noon on the 22nd, the sun is in Leo. Now, Leo is a fixed sign. It's the second sign of the summer months. And in many ways, it represents the fixed summer sun, that is relentless. It, it's when the flowers are putting on their show. Um, the Leo is the midsummer. It's it, uh, Cancer is the beginning of summer. The first day of summer being the summer solstice. But now we're in the heat of the summer. Um, the sun moving into Leo, and as it moves into Leo it's going to make its exact opposition with Pluto. It doesn't, it, it, it does that on the 22nd, but it doesn't do it until evening. 10.37 p.m. is when it's exact. But this is an, a very important opposition because this is bringing out the deep power struggles that are going on behind the surface all the time, whether we know it or not, yet it's bringing some of these power struggles right out into the open, and it's doing it in a way that might have a bit too much anger or aggression tied to it. Why do I say that? Because Mars, if you look at this sun-opposed Pluto, Mars is actually making that trine still to Pluto, just slightly after it, 
but the sun is also making that sextile to Mars. It's not exact yet for a couple of days, but that's so tight and so close. Um, the sun trine Mars or the sun sextile Mars is not exact for a couple of days on the 24th. But what that means is that Mars is at that point of Thales, which is the point when there's an opposition. It's the point that's trying one side of the opposition, that would be to Pluto, and sextile the other point in the opposition, the other end of the opposition, that would be the Sun. And so Mars is relieving the pent-up tension of that tension from the power struggle that's going on from what's hidden to what's out in the open. And I think that this opposition is extremely important. Um, like I said, it's exact at 10.37 p.m. on um, on today, Monday, um, the 22nd. Um, and, and the moon still being in Aquarius, um, you know, and, and Pluto and Aquarius, there's that sense of the larger collective, the what's going on in the outer world, the global, the community, outside of our individual selves. As we move this to the 23rd, on the 23rd, um, we can see, first of all, that the moon moves into Pisces. The moon actually enters Pisces um, early in the morning at 6.22 a.m. on Tuesday the 23rd. Um, and this can soften the energy a bit. It can confuse us a bit. As the moon moves into Pisces, <clears throat> what it's going to do um, uh, on, late on Monday is it'll make a square with Uranus and Taurus. And then as it moves into Pisces um, in the morning of the 23rd, um, by midday, it's going to be making a square to Mars um, in um in in Gemini and that square to Mars in Gemini is it's a moon square so it comes and goes pretty quickly it's passing um, it's not it's not a very long held um, energy but it, but it is significant because it can mean an emotional flare-up because again Mars can get hot under the collar that Mars is still within range of being uh, trying to to um, to Pluto and sextile to the Sun, and so I think it's important on the twenty uh, third um, to note that 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 Moon in Pisces can stir up a little bit of energy, and on top of that, Venus moving through mid Leo is actually making a square and a half with Neptune, and that makes it difficult to know what's going on. Oh, it's it can be beautiful. This can be a beautiful illusion. This can be falling in love with a person, with an idea, with an event, of a notion of doing something, with a goal, with a with with with, with a vision of what's to come. But it's it's Venus and Neptune, and so we have to remember that there's always a peace of, of dream, of wish fulfillment, of illusion tied up to what we're imagining um, today on the 23rd. The 24th astrologically is a bit of a quiet day. Um, the moon, however, is coming through mid degrees of Pisces. It'll catch up to um, Saturn um, midday, which can be a bit of a depressor, a bit of a restraint, a bit of a reality check, a bit of like, oh shoot, we got to do this, I have to do that, whatever. Um, it's it's not easy, but again, it's not long lasting, and often these moon transits to Saturn are simply reminders for us to be responsible, to take care of business, uh, to fulfill our promises, um, things 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 of that sort. We also have Mercury coming into an intriguing position because by um, the following morning, by Thursday the 25th, by Thursday morning, Mercury is making a quincunx, that's five twelfths of a circle, to Pluto on one side and to, um, uh, to Neptune on the other side. And this actually is creating um, what's, what's called a, a yod. This is actually unfolding today and tomorrow because Mercury will hit the quincunx to Neptune on the 25th and it won't, it won't reach the exact quincunx to Pluto um, until um, midday on the 26th. 
But this is creating what's called a yod or finger of God, and it has to do with the ongoing sextile between um, Neptune and Pluto and how their halfway point between the two of them, let's just call that zero degrees Aries. It's not quite, Neptune's retrograding away from that, but it's, but it's within a quarter of a degree. So let's say zero degrees of Aries and zero degrees of Aquarius, um, that halfway point is, um, is zero degrees of Pisces. And we go opposite that, and we have Mercury at zero degrees of Virgo. Okay, it's at 29 degrees and 53 minutes, but over the next day, it's going to be moving into that exact point, and it's going to be making this, uh, th- this aspect called, or an aspect uh, configuration, uh, called a finger of God or a yod, where you have the combined elements of the imagination and the creativity, the spirituality of Neptune, and the metamorphic changes and the transformational intensity of deconstructing and reconstructing of Pluto, somehow being worked out and talked about out here on the outer realms. It's an interesting little configuration. Um, we'll see who's talking about what, because often here the community communication um, may be obviously important, but it's, it, it, it can't quite get to the truth because it's, it, it's at odds. It's, it's at this point of adjustment with both Pluto and, um, and Neptune. So I think the 25th has the makings of a bit of a confusing day as Mercury leaves Leo and enters its home sign where it actually theoretically prefers to be even more than in Gemini, its other home sign, because Mercury in Virgo is also practical and it's effective and it's efficient. And so we begin this period with Mercury moving into Virgo on the 25th. But remember, Mercury um, actually turns retrograde um, on, um, on August 4th, and then it quickly retrogrades back into Leo um, on August 14th. And so Mercury is not done in Leo, even though it's dipping its toes into Virgo as if it's going to be seeking um, the perfection that it needs now, but it doesn't yet have. All right, so that takes us um, to through July 25th. Um, oh, and on July 25th, um, we also have um, Mars and Sun making that uh, sextile that I've been talking about for a while, but here we can see it exact, the Sun um, at three degrees of Leo and Mars now at three degrees of Gemini, um, and I think that that's quite important. Interestingly, the Moon moves into Aries on the 25th, And the moon moving into Aries occurs at 7.52 a.m. And by noon, you can see that the moon is already at 2 degrees of Aries. What that means is that by mid-afternoon, roughly um, roughly 2 p.m. Pacific time, the moon will be at 3 degrees of Aries, where it will be trining the sun and sextiling Uh, Mercury, and this is very, very smooth. That moon will also move through through a sextile to to Pluto. Again, um, these days are incredibly powerful, but they may not be as negative or as complicated as things have been. There are complicating factors, including the fact that on the 25th, the sun is moving toward a square and a half with Saturn, that's not exact until the 26th. And on the 26th, um, the sun makes a square and a half to Saturn, which again is a reality check. It's the light of Leo, the, the good intentions, the even the pride, the too much intentions, the look at me, all of that stuff is kind of has to answer to Saturn saying, is this necessary? Is this real? What are we doing with this? How do we bring this around um, to what to something that is absolutely real? And of course, we also noticed that through this period of time, Chiron has been slowing down. And on the 26th, it makes its station. Now, again, Chiron has been moving really, really slowly. I mean, um, you know, e- even just looking, you know, a week back, um, on July 19th, 
uh, Chiron was at 23 degrees Aries 31 minutes, and now it's at 30, 23 degrees Aries 32 minutes, and in a week, it's still one minute away at 23 degrees Aries in 31 minutes. And so, although Chiron is turning uh, retrograde, it's actually holding its position. And remember, when a planet holds its position, it, when it's stationary, it has more power. It, 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 it's the slower moving the planet, the, the more power it somehow, somehow holds. And as such, it's very important that over the next three, four days, Venus at 18 degrees of Leo here on the 26th will come into an exact trine with um, stationary direct Chiron. And I think this is an incredible day for healing. We'll see what it is that we heal or if we blow this opportunity. So that's what's happening on the 26th. And then, interestingly enough, aside from lunar transits, we have a couple of quiet days. Now, on the, 20, uh, on, on the 27th, on the 28th, um, there's really no um, planet-to-planet aspects that are exact. I mean, there's moon stuff going on. I mean, the moon moves into... Taurus on the morning, on Saturday morning at 10.22 a.m., um, the moon moves into Taurus, and as it does that, it's uh, going to square Pluto, and that can be quite disruptive, especially because, you remember, Pluto has already been um, under siege by that quincunx from Mercury, so the moon will square Pluto and make a trine to Mercury, and this is one of those good news, bad news things, but it only lasts for an hour or two or three I don't see a whole lot happening here um, on the 27th, on the 28th. There's still not a lot going on. Um, that is on, on the 27th, the moon moves into Taurus. On the 28th, the moon is moving through Taurus. Um, by Monday, um, the 29th, the moon midday is actually still at the very end of Taurus, but lined up with Uranus. There's a bit more action here. I think this week is going to be a real action week um, that gets us through the end of July and into um, and, and into um, uh, August. Um, but I also want to say another couple of things about these days of the 26th, 27th, 28th, really, 20, 26th, 27th, 28th, where there's not a lot of, pl- not a lot of planetary transits. And what I want to say is that sometimes when the sky is quiet, that gives us time to kind of follow through on all those things that we hadn't dealt with. Whatever transits happened last week or even last month, sometimes when there's a bit of... (sighs) it's, It's like we work hard all week and then on Saturday we finally have a day to take off and we have a splitting headache or we get sick because it's a down day, and the body knows that it's a down day, and so it process- It didn't have time to, to get sick or to have a headache while things were going on. And I think often that happens astrologically. So let's just pay attention to that over this weekend of, um, of, of the 27th and 28th. And by the 29th, I think things are cooking again. And I mentioned earlier also, as we talked about the station of Chiron, that Venus would be coming into an exact trine. Here on the 29th, we can see that Venus is still one degree away. But if I move this to July 30th, there we can see that Venus is making exact 23 degrees to 23 degrees um, from Leo to um, to Aries, and that Venus trine Chiron um, can be really magical. It, it can mean that that we have a heightened sense of what can help someone, and we can do it. Um, it's it, it's like Venus Chiron harmonizing with one another. Um, gives us the ability um, to have empathy. It gives us the ability to, even if we disagree with someone, even if someone we don't like is hurting, we somehow can reach out and feel what that feels like. We don't have to believe what they believe. We don't have to, um, we don't have to buy their perspective, but 
simply by acknowledging, by by having empathy, by having um, by caring about someone, this gives us the ability to heal, and that's so desperately needed at this point in time, regardless of where we go individually, collectively, politically, globally. The the um, disassociation that we humans have with other humans right now is severe. And I think this Venus trine Chiron um, gives us an ability to help others realize their full potential. And it also gives us the ability to realize our full potential if we accept what others are saying about us and taking that in as healing and helping rather than trying to keep walls up because we feel vulnerable. So I think the month ends on on very much of... uh, uh, potentially on on an up note. Uh, by the way, the moon also moved into uh, Gemini um, on Monday morning, and um, all through Tuesday on the 30th, um, that moon in Gemini um, is moving and aligning with both Mars and Jupiter. And look at Mars and Jupiter, they're still, um, you know, they're, they're still um, uh, eight degrees um, apart, but remember, they are coming together and they will eventually conjoin on August 19th, the same day as the full moon in Aquarius and the same day as the opening of the Democratic National Convention. Um, as we move to the 31st again, we still have that Venus trine in Chiron in operation. But once again, the end of the month from a planetary standpoint is relatively calm. Um, The moon does move out of Gemini and into Cancer at 8.19 p.m. And so we begin August with a a caring um, Cancer moon. um, And we'll have a whole lot more to say about that when I do the August forecast. So... That's the day-by-day day for the um, second half of July. Um, thank you all for uh, supporting this work. Remember, if you don't get the mid-month updates and you want to, you can go to patreon.com slash Levine and just simply sign up for the solar tier. There's other levels of involvement. The important thing is that there's no subscription required. You can sign up and you can unsign yourself out Take yourself off the list anytime you want. Um, It's billed on the first of every month. And so, um, you know, so if you'd like to support this work and receive these mid-monthlies, this is your opportunity. Other than that, I will see you all on August 1st. And this summer continues to be a astrological rock and roll crazy um, tilt the world ride. And we are on it. We will make it through it. Um, And it's really important to make sure that we don't just shut out everything that's going on and become ostriches burying our heads in the sand. Do they really do that? Um, Because there's, there's two potentials for creating more problems than solving them. One of them is overreacting impulsively in the moment with that Uranus, Mars, Jupiter stuff going on. It's it's like we need to just put a check on ourselves just to turn the volume down a bit while all this uncertainty, craziness, confusion plays on through. It's going to play on through. But at the same time, we can't go hide because if we do, then whatever happens will basically happen without our function, without our role in it. And and you and I individually have no power. But you and I and you and you and him and her and them, all together, we actually do have power. And it becomes incumbent upon each and every one of us in these times to think cosmically, but act locally. Because when we act locally, even if it's just helping a partner out, holding a door open for someone, taking out the trash, being nice to someone, listening to someone who calls you, it's these little acts of of love, of appreciation, of kindness, of empathy, um, of consideration, of compassion that basically will, in the end, make whatever happens okay. Because we have the impact now, but we won't later on as this energy closes down. So 
there you go. Be safe out there. Think cosmically. Act locally. See you on August 1st. I'm Rick Levine, and see you soon.